welcome everybody to another glorious episode of the Put on Raiders podcast. I'm your host, Dwayne Douglas, along with Ryan Holmes, and we are podcasting off the 1 0 shores of the Pacific Ocean. 1 0, 1 0, 1 0. The Raiders, um, in true Raider fashion, of course. Um, win that game Monday night football. Um, you were there. So let's, let's just start off with that too. Like you were there. Um, you'll see our, um, Twitter handles underneath on the, on the, on the right underneath us. So please hit us up on our Twitter handles. And then also, um, on the put on, put on, put on, put on Raiders, um, Instagram. And then you have the Raiders pod at Raiders pod is our, um, Twitter handle for the show. But what was that atmosphere like? Um, was it, 50 percent um ravens fans like every like like the media was saying it was no it wasn't i'm glad to have my voice back i didn't have my voice for a couple of days afterwards so uh, sorry for the delay getting to this recap show but no the environment was was amazing i'd say early on during pregames it was more like 90 percent raider fan 10 percent ravens fans by kickoff i'd say it was closer to 80 20 um pretty normal for any stadium it wasn't a Ravens takeover, like you heard on Twitter, that might happen. It, it was probably, like I said, 80% uh, Raiders fans. There was a section down in uh, the north end zone on the Ravens side of the field. Must have been friends and family. There was a little pocket of Ravens fans there. But yeah. uh, for the most part, uh, it was a Raiders home game. It was probably the loudest stadium I've ever been in. I, I was amazed at how loud it got in there. Yeah. Uh, I was really surprised the Ravens only got one false start penalty there in the game because mm-hmm. I mean I, I was couldn't even hear the person sitting next to me most of the game, mm-hmm. um, and just you know the back and forth nature of it, um, Monday Night Football, all that hype. There, Steve Aoki, uh, they had a DJ. I guess he's a world famous DJ. I didn't know who he was. I had to Google him yeah, to figure out who he was. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. he was there. Um, Ice Cube and Too Short did the halftime show. Gladys Knight uh, did the national anthem. So. I mean, it was a once in a lifetime experience to be in that stadium for first real game Monday night, just kind of the fashion the game went. It was kind of like being in Vegas, the ups and downs. Um, you're down on your luck, then you're up. And then next thing you know, you're down. And at the end of the day, you walk out uh, with a little bit of winning so with a W in your pocket. So overall, it was a tremendous atmosphere. It's a great stadium. It, yeah, it, it is. And the, and the Raiders finally found their home, it looks like, because, I mean, I, everybody, I mean, from LeBron James, everybody's watching that game. And it was everybody, everybody who was watching that game said, you know, it was it was beautiful to watch. So um, you did, you know, I want to go right to some of the footage. Um, so some of the um, cause the Raiders defense did play pretty did play pretty well in this game. I'll see if I can put some footage up here for you for us. But um, in a second. But, um, um, I do, let's start off with Max, because we talked about it. We went, we went back and forth about um, how, how, you know, you, you saw him in camp. You talked about how, how, how great he looked at camp, how great he looked in camp. And it was just, he just dominated this football game. I mean, he really was scary to watch. Um, if, if you were a Raven fan, he was in the backfield consistently all the time. No, definitely. And for the people that listen to this podcast, they, they heard me talk about how, how he dominated the Rams, basically, in that Wednesday scrimmage during the preseason. Uh, during the joint practices, he, he was unblockable, and, and to see him carry over into the game. And a lot of it, you know, it's just his length, the motor, but it's, it's its hands usage. You could tell he's put in the work in the offseason and in the weight room. Uh, he's lost some weight. He's probably in the 260 range. He's leaner, but he's a lot stronger, the way that he was able to hold out the tackles. Uh, and, and be a force in the run game too, which was just as surprising uh, as the pass rush. But uh, Lamar Jackson's a very slippery guy that can get out of a lot of situations. And for Max to get him on the ground twice, and there was, you know, if he has an, an ordinary quarterback, you, you might be looking at a three, four, five set game with the amount of time that he got into the backfield and got pressure. And he just abused Bill in a wave of the whole night. The most impressive thing for me was in, in overtime when they were in that, that bootleg coming out. Uh, to the offensive right side, then you saw Max basically run him down and make him throw the ball away. I thought that that was really impressive. And this is not coordinated by any stretch of the imagination. The first clip that I'm that I wanted to show of Max Crosby is is yeah. that clip of him. Um, they tried to do something here on the outside, and he was having none of it. Like I mean, look at that yeah. pursuit. Look at that um, ability to get to the outside. He did not um, allow him to turn the corner at all. I mean, they are just they attacked those hash marks um, and, and those, um, those, um, those, those meshes right there. So he couldn't get, he couldn't go, go anywhere. And that's usually a big, that's usually a big play for them. I mean, it's usually a big play for them. Um, they usually get like six, seven yards on that. if not a bigger play than that, but Max was tremendous in that 
in that uh, in that moment there. And I I I, I thought I, I thought it really set the tone that you know, hey, the, he wasn't tired, he wasn't done, and the, and the, and the and the Raiders defense continued to put pressure and apply pressure to uh, uh, Lamar Jackson. Definitely, and I'll be the first one to say it. After last season, you know, Max didn't live up to the expectations that that I had for him, and some people had for him, and. You know, during the season, we didn't know that he had a broken hand and he needed shoulder surgery. He basically fought through multiple injuries. I, he didn't hold up very well in the run game last year. So is it, to see the way that he came out and played in week one, if he can give you that effort for 17 weeks, this guy's going to the Pro Bowl. Whether it's this year or next year, it's going to be soon. Uh, and he's going to get a monster contract from the Raiders. But um, just, to, just to see that the pursuit that he had for four quarters plus overtime, chasing Lamar Jackson around, uh, it's going to get a little bit easier for him you know, trying to chase guys that aren't nearly as mobile coming up on the schedule. So I fully expect Max to be a force for the rest of the season. That's the first thing I thought about was like, he's going to be going against, I'm going to go through the schedule. It, 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 there are, there, there, there's some statues in this, in this, in this. Yeah, there is. And there's some statues there. There's not the guys who are going to be doing donuts in the, in the pocket. He He's going to be able to have um, some success there. That's why I think, I mean, now, I mean, he might, if he stays healthy, I mean, double digits is going to be, you know, the low point. If he gets 10, 10 will be the low, will be the floor, if you will, with the ceiling being unlimited, how many stats he can get. And I do like, I don't know if you, did you see, watch the sounds of the game that the Raiders put out this yeah, week? I did. Like, I don't know what, I don't know why those two get along so well. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how they click so well, but he and Yannick are like, like Steph and Clay, like whatever two, like, you know, like, you know, we, you know, like Kobe and Gasol, like whatever combination you want to talk about, they really do appreciate each other and they have a goal to really raise havoc. And I think Yannick um, in a lot of ways, um, you know, he, he, he did a good job as well when he was in there, did get hurt with a hamstring. We, um, looks like he's going to play this week, but um, we talk about him too. Cause I mean, he, I thought, I thought that relationship there is really something that's really, the Raiders have not had, those kind of like just bookend guys who can, who can, who can, um, who can um, rush the passer in a long time. And I thought Yannick, when he was in there, did a pretty, pretty good job against the run as well. Yeah. Yannick played well. He, he got pressure and he kind of used basically the same move where he's got that jump move with the cross chop where he could get the edge. And, and you saw just his, his initial quickness to get off the ball that he's really quick out of his stance. And he gave Ronnie Stanley, who's a top five, top seven left tackle in this league problems all night. And you know they went up against each other in practice last year a lot. So so Stanley knew what was coming, and he still couldn't block him. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be as effective this week coming off that hamstring. For me, I think he's going to play more in a, in a third down rusher role, limit those snaps. You know, get Farrell, get massive in there on running downs early, uh, and then let Yannick eat off the edge. But as far as that relationship, it's clear that that they're trying to develop leadership on, on the defensive side. I think. They're going to need a nickname sooner than later. And, and the salt and pepper of Farrell and Crosby has gone by the wayside. So we're going to need to figure something out for, for the new dynamic duo of Crosby and Ngakwe. No question about it. So here is here, here you posted this on um, on your Twitter handle, um, our home 22. Um, what was this yes. here? Um, can, we, can, we, can we go over this for the fans? Yeah, basically this is just a simple cover three that Gus Bradley runs. It was just an example of how everything works. You can see, you know, the two corners and then Merrick there in the middle are, are playing the third. So they're the deep third and then the middle third. And then you have the four underneath guys playing hook, curl and flat. And you can just see how when everyone does their job and their responsibility, they force the check down and then they rally and tackle there in the middle of the field. So it's just, you know, sound fundamental defense stuff we haven't seen from this Raiders defense in a long time that, you know, just seeing everyone that's coordinated, they all know the routes. The most impressive thing on this to me is Corey Littleton. He's playing the will linebacker there. And you can see that he sees Marquise Brown coming across the field uh, and abandons his kind of hook curl there and goes with that crossing route, which is what his job is mm -hmm. uh, versus that formation. And it basically takes that route away. Corey Littleton played really well in this game. I know he had 10 tackles. He missed some tackles. But if you watch the all 22 and watch how he moves and the coverage skills that he had and the routes that he was able to take away, it was impressive. He, he's going to be a big piece of this defense, uh, pass defense wise, especially when they face teams that want to challenge them vertically uh, and then those crossing routes against cover three, they're going to need a guy that's athletic and that can move around and, and play coverage. And just because he didn't show up on the broadcast film, you didn't see them throw the ball to him. Doesn't mean he had a bad game because he missed a couple of tackles, Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Uh, and you heard Gus Bradley even brought him up on, 
uh, on the press conference yesterday that he thought he played well on film and he did uh, his coverage skills are, are elite for a linebacker yeah he can run he really can <laughs> run and, and and that's what we wanted to see right we wanted to see yeah. that um last year and um you know we we had, a, we had a different defensive coordinator last year i'm not sure if people noticed that um um you i remember when you when we, when the raiders picked up jefferson you got excited. And then I had to go look at film about him because I was like, okay, if he's really that excited about, it, let me go see um, what, what, it, but he was able to get pressure up the middle. And I thought that I, I listen, this, like when, when somebody goes airborne and you go airborne and you, and you, and you create that strip sack, they, they really believe in this system and they kind of just sold out on so many plays. I saw, I saw, people, I saw so many players going selling out to make to make great plays and Jefferson made made some really good plays in this one. Oh definitely Quinn Jefferson is played in this defense as a three technique. He's kind of undervalued uh nationally. He, did, he played in a nice rotation in Buffalo. Uh he's never been a six, seven, eight sack guy, but he's consistently in that four or five range. Uh he does cause fumbles when he gets around the quarterback, but his pressure rate has always been high. Like he's always been able to put pressure on a quarterback and the Raiders need that on the interior. Now it's even more important. When, you, when we have these two guys flying off the edge, uh, quarterbacks can't step up if you have Phylon played well and then Jefferson. And for me, I agree. Like I, I remember seasons where I don't remember the Raiders defense recovering a single fumble, it feels like. And to see them get the ball on the ground four times against Baltimore, who's a team that doesn't fumble a lot. Yeah. And it's a team that's used to running the ball and having guys attack them. To see Lamar Jackson fumble three times and even the play on the sideline where, where Abram came over I believe with Littleton, they caused a fumble that went out of bounds. But oh, that was um, close. just to see guys, that was close. At, just to see guys attack the football and get it on the ground, uh, it, it's important. And just I thought fundamentally watching the film on the defense, everyone basically did what they were supposed to do. Uh, they want they want the teams to throw the ball in the flat and rally and tackle. They were able to do that. Now Lamar Jackson is not a guy that's going to challenge him vertically, um, so I don't know how I feel about the cornerbacks and Merrick didn't really get challenged either. It's going to change this week with Pittsburgh because, you know, they're going to try to throw the ball down the field at times uh, and use those weapons. But overall, like to see a Raiders defense play with fundament, fundamentally sound technique uh, and be where they're supposed to be. There was no blown coverages. Uh, there wasn't a ton of missed tackles. You're going to miss tackles against Baltimore and some of the athletes they have. It's football, but uh, just there wasn't any big glaring missed assignments guys running wide open that we're used to seeing and that's what I was impressed with and then the pass rush got there consistently and this is one of my favorite plays I thought Abram you brought up Abram's name and I love a, an un, uh, 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 under control Jonathan Abram I, I love yes. him and I, I love him in this and this was a huge play in the game because this came this play came right I believe right before um, um, Nasbin came in and and he created a fumble recovered by Phylon and they, uh, and, and, they up, and, then, and they ended up um, getting the ball back in overtime. But here he just plays fast, right? And just knocks the ball out, almost a fumble on this play. Um, that's Mark Andrews too. So it's not like it was some scrub um, the, um, the, um, tight end here. He, he, he played, this is what Gus Bradley talks about, playing fast, get the ball out. And he's able to, he, he, he's able to close on that, knock the ball out. And then next thing you know, they run, they run this play here where it, where Nazza comes around the outside, gets a clear shot at the quarterback, and that's the game. I mean, that's the game right there. Once once we once the Raiders got the ball back, sorry, I let a wee out. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> once once the Raiders got the ball back on that situation, then and then they knew it was pretty much over. Um, you knew all you, you knew all you uh, needed was um, a field goal. And speaking of field goal, um, I mean, are we watching this, are we watching the second coming of Janikowski and Leckler? Like that was some serious punting. That was some serious. I mean, he is becoming pretty money. I think you cut out there for a second. I was saying as far in special teams as well. Yeah, A.J. Cole had a great game uh, punting the ball. And I, I definitely don't miss the Johnny Townsend days where he's punting the ball 35, 40 yards. So, <laughs> Johnny, uh, Johnny Townsend. <laughs> great job by, by the scouting department to go find uh, A.J. Cole. I, I want to say North Carolina State is where they got him as an undrafted free agent. I could be wrong there. But, yeah, Carlson, you know, he was drafted for a reason by Minnesota. They gave up on him after a couple of weeks. Uh, thankfully, the Raiders went out and got him and added him. And 
he's got a big leg and that 55 yarder is probably good from 63, 64. He made it pretty easily. Um, th there was a false start on that play by Brandon Parker, but we, we won't bring that up. The, the refs missed that one, but we'll, we'll take that game winner or the game yeah. tired. Oh my over God. But what about the, um, um, the, Al the Al 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 Leatherwood false start was, 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 was tough to watch. I'll tell you that one. That was tough to watch. Um, so it was. it was tough to watch. I mean, you were you were there too. So um, let's see here. Um, Perryman, I thought I thought I thought, I thought Perryman was everywhere as well. Uh, looked very fluid. They was able to get some um, in the run game and and um, pursuit on the outside uh, played well as well. Played well in this game. Um, how much are they going to miss um, Denzel Good here going forward? Yeah, props to Denzel Good. He, he tore his ACL and came back in the game, I think, for seven to ten plays, something like that. And to do that, you know, shows the toughness and his wanting to be out there. Uh, I don't think they're going to miss him a ton if Richie Incognito can come back in the next week or two. Uh, I thought Illuminaire played pretty well. Like, for a guy that just showed up a week ago, hasn't been in the system, uh, he does have starting experience. He played eight games last year. He started eight games for New England last year. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised. I, I want to say he was with Jacksonville in camp and they released him. I'm surprised they did because uh, he came in and played pretty well. I think it's going to take the Raiders out of that outside run uh, zone game for a little bit, uh, bringing him in. He, he's not the most mobile, most athletic guy. He's more of a big mauler on the inside, mm -hmm. similar to Simpson. So I think we're going to see a lot more inside zone, inside running. Uh, which might be an issue with Andre James, but it's going to change the run game a little bit. But but I think they have enough depth to, to survive that as long as Incognito can come back and give them, you know, eight to ten games at some point during the season. I, I think they're going to have to sign somebody else. I, I just don't see Incognito. I, I mean, I, I love to see him come back because, I mean, they can do a lot of stuff with Incognito. I love when Incognito is on the same side as, as Cole Miller. They, they can do some good things there, but I just don't. I can't, I can't hold my breath for that one. Hopefully he does come back, but I mean, uh, we'll, have, we'll have to see and, um, and, and check and check the injury report to see if he'll be back. Um, what are your feelings about Drake? I thought Drake was as, as advertised, really good outside, really good um, out of the backfield. I, this was a game where I wish Gruden had a couple of things in his arsenal and his toolkit. And one thing would be like just the screen. I mean, they were blitzing so many people that I feel like if they just dropped the ball at a screen pass to, <laughs> to, to um, Drake, he'd have been running for days um, against this um, against this Raven um, crazy, crazy front that, you know, that Wink Martindale does. Um, how do you feel like Drake's debut as a Raider went? I, I liked it. I thought he played really well. I I even said this the other day. I don't think the Raiders win that game if they don't have Kenyon Drake. The, the ability for him to pick up the blitz, yeah, uh, especially coming up the A gap, and, and to see his ability to constantly not only pick up the blitz, but push the guy aside to give Derek Carr enough room to, to maneuver and get throws off. And then obviously we saw his catching really at five catches for 59 yards, showed us a little bit of everything. Uh, he ran an angle route out of the backfield that he was able to get a big gain on. Um, the anticipation, Carr hit him in the flat on, on another play. It, I don't, it was, I think, in the third quarter. Carr threw the ball before he even turned around. Like yes, just, just, the ability yeah. for him. Yeah, uh, it was up to, on the left sideline, but you, you saw a lot of Kenny Drake. We're going to see him a lot this weekend, clearly with, with Jacobs not playing, but um, a lot, a lot of Raider fans are upset when they signed him when they saw that contract. I don't think any of them are going to be complaining here in the next couple of weeks after yeah. we see what Kenyon Drake's going to be able to do uh, and go. how much he's helped this team already. Yeah, they're going to go a little quiet here. They're going to go a little quiet here yeah. as he, um, and listen, if you were like me and you do play fantasy football and you, Drafted Jacobs and you to also took Kenyon Drake. You know, good for you. Good for you. That's smart. That's smart. Um, I, I think the interesting thing that for me, and I don't know if it was noticed a lot on the TV broadcast, is when Gruden needed to go into the two minute, and even at some of those drives uh, in the fourth quarter, if you've noticed his personnel package, he had two tight ends and Ingold on the field with Zay Jones and Waller. Um, uh -huh. He took Edwards and Ruggs out there, and I think it, you know, Zay Jones, the comfort level, but it was more. He helped Leatherwood, uh, and we're going to see a lot of that this week. Moreau didn't get any catches, but you saw Moreau lining up on the same side as the running back on the opposite side of the three-by-one formation uh, to help block. So I think Moreau had a pretty good game pass blocking, when, what they asked him to do. Mm -hmm. um, but putting Ingold out wide actually helped them identify the coverages because they could see who was going out there. And um, it, it was impressive to see Carr just be able to pick up 
where all the, where everyone was coming from. They, they had seven, eight guys on the line of scrimmage constantly. Yeah. Um, and he was able, you know, the three sacks, well, one Leatherwood just got whipped. He got beat on one. One was uh, just a nice play by, by Patrick Queen. He did a great job on that stunt. play. Yeah. It, it, yeah. There's it, nothing you can do on that yeah. one. You tip your cap on that, for. yeah. On that broadcast, it was funny because Carr was getting Carr was getting some heat, and then Greasy was giving um, Carr props. And then immediately yeah. when that play happened, you heard Lewis Riddick say, "Hey, uh, we think about um, what the quarterback's going through um, as well as defensive players. I hear they're going back. It was actually yeah. a good back and forth between Greasy and." And um and Riddick and, and Lewis Riddick there, but yeah, I mean he that was a great play by Patrick Queen. That was a great you, nothing okay. you could do about that. And 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 he didn't he didn't fumble. He took the sack. I love I, I love when the sack is just taken and there's no there's no extra yeah. no extra stuff there. But by by Derek, um, you know, the short yardage. Um, where is that cracker when you need him? Um, <laughs> I mean they are really they are. I thought I thought I kind of I, I think Derek scored on that on, on that on that sneak, but um I mean because they couldn't find the ball, they just second effort he he got in they pushed yeah, him from behind they, they pushed but, him from behind yeah. but like it, it it wasn't clean so I don't know I mean I, he said he's friends I, with Tom Brady figure uh, ask Tom how how Tom gets an end zone so clean on uh, all those because 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 Derek can't yeah. do it really well and I just thought um you know we we spoke about the good part of the Raider victory. Um, you know, as Andre James, you know, that's something we gotta, we gotta kind of talk to as well. Yeah. I mean, it was clear at the game. And then again, when I watched the broadcast and the all 22, um, he's a liability in the run game right now. He, he he's, you can see the thought process if they were going to run a lot of outside zone, because there were times where he was able to get to the second level and make some blocks, especially on the Jacobs touchdown run. But you know what Baltimore did? They said, we're going to put a nose tackle zero technique right on top of him and not allow him to do that. And then he just got bullied. He had a couple of holding penalties. Calais Campbell got him on that fourth and one, just whipped him with a swim move. Um, pass protection, he held up okay. Clearly, they wanted the running back to pick up the eight-gap eight gap blitzes uh, when they brought the backers. Um, but in the run game, he couldn't really get it going. And now when we, you have to go to the backup guards this week with Simpson and Illuminaire, it's going to be tough because those guys aren't really going to want to run outside zone behind them. Um, so if they're going to try to run the ball up the middle, they're going to have a hard time doing it with Andre James right now. It, his technique's not bad. It's more just, you know, his strength and his ability to move bigger body guys on the interior. He just hasn't done it. And, and to his credit, we are talking about Calais Campbell and Brandon Williams, who the 340 pound bowling yes, ball. Yes, those are not so. easy guys to move, but it doesn't get any easier this week. I expect Pittsburgh to put uh, Cam Hayward right on top of, uh, Andre James, a majority of this game. We'll see if he can handle that. Because um, you can't really help him double. Now, Andre James, he's going to be better when he's not playing a zero technique, when, when there's a three technique to both sides and he can get to the second level. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe he's got a shade where the guard can help him on the double team and then he can get to the second level. But when teams want to do a bare front, put a guy right on top of him, uh, he, he's not going to be able to hold up in the run game right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's, it's, only, start, it's only start number two. So I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go ham on the kid. Like you know what I mean. So um, he's obviously gonna be there for. The, it's gonna take a lot to get him off the field because yeah. that that contract. They believe in him. So so we'll see. Um, do you feel like? I mean, what, the times he got to the second level. Do you? And, and there's times where he could just. Do you want to see your center just continue to block and just and just and just and just push and just like knock that linebacker out? Um, or do you want to see him just like kind of just like because it just seemed like especially on the run that um, that uh, Jacobs had it was sweet run sweet run by Jacobs there um, he kind of just held up against Patrick Queen when he had a chance like kind of kind of like he was just like kind of like get, like just getting his way where he could have just smashed yeah. him you know yeah I think there was times where he climbed too early to the second level and and kind of when they were trying to do some double teams and then it got beat where he didn't stay long enough on it. Um, which kind of hurt the guard, but for me, yeah, you'd like to see a center get in there and bury that guy. But you know, if he just makes the block and gets in the way, I'm fine with that too. As yeah. long as the running back, you know, Jacobs made a nice cut off that to work back off oh, the hip to that, get it inside. A, but that was, um, some, that was some Marcus Allen run right there. That was nice. Yeah. And in his in his defense, his pass protection, he held up pretty well in pass protection. You know, Carr was able to step up and make some throws in the pocket, uh, where James was able to give him some room. Um, I just think for a team that wants to run the ball as much as Gruden does right now, it's a liability inside. 
Yeah, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough to see what they do this week. Um, so I did I did well I did listen to a lot of people who cover the Steelers this week. So I'm gonna hold unless you have more on this game. I was, I was gonna flip. I was gonna flip kind of flip and talk about talk about Pittsburgh this week a little bit. But there, the people who fans think it's gonna be twenty seven three. They feel like it's gonna be a really close game, a really good game um, between the two teams. And the fact that their their top slot corner, who used to come off blitzes and be their slot, the who really would do a good job against slot receivers is going to be missed because the Raiders have Hunter Renfro. And they feel like the Raiders should, if they're going to run the ball on them, spread them out and run rather than try to run out of, you know, two tight end situations there. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, I saw, I saw a little bit of Pittsburgh on all 22 this week. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about that? As far as, as far as, you know, the Raiders going from this game to the Steelers now, totally different opponent. Yeah, it's. I think Jacobs being out, it changes everything. So I, I don't think the Raiders are going to try to run the ball a ton. I don't think they're going to be able to run it a ton. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of what you saw in the second half against Baltimore. They're going to spread them out. Um, I don't think they need to be as clever, like put Ingold out there, try to figure out if it's man or zone, because Pittsburgh's going to run zone. They're not going to run a ton of man. Um, so I think Zay Jones is going to be more involved this week. Uh, Moreau will probably be brought in to, to help block and help the edge. But the Raiders have to avoid being in third and long. They can't get in third and seven, third and 10, third and 12 uh, against this defense because they're not going to hold up. Cam Hayward, TJ Watt, those guys are going to get to the quarterback. So the key to this game is spread them out four or five wide, and you're going to see the dink and dunk show four or five yards. You want to work the middle of the field. Pittsburgh's notorious for having their linebacker stay on the field and try to cover slot receivers. So uh, I think you're going to have a big game out of Hunter Renfro. Uh, they're going to be able to scheme up. Uh, Darren Waller in the middle of the field. Uh, I think you're going to have Kenyon Drake uh, working some routes in the middle of the field. I don't think you're going to see big explosive plays on the outside. Uh, they'll take their shots when the looks are there. If, if the safeties want to come down, um, Minka Fitzpatrick uh, did a lot of, you know, being a robber or a rat hole defender last week against Buffalo. He'll probably continue to try to do that to get another defender in the middle of the field. Uh, and when that happens, they're going to have to take shots down the field because I do think that Ruggs and Edwards can can beat the corners for the Steelers. I'm not Joe Hayward to me or Joe Hayden. He's he's a good corner. He's an older guy. Doesn't run as well. Mm -hmm. um, we can take chances against him or the Raiders can. And then on the other side, Cam Sutton's a younger player. Uh, so I, I think you're going to see that. But it's going to be a lot of underneath four or five yards, second and four, second and six. Just try to keep on schedule. And then if the Raiders can get into some third and shorts third and two, third and four, then you can run some bunch formations with some rubs and some picks and do what they need to do to pick up first downs. But I think it's going to be a low scoring game. I don't think the Raiders are going to go out there and put up, you know, 30 plus points on this defense. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a little bit similar. Maybe, maybe a little bit, a little, a little bit more high scoring than the Cleveland game last year, because, because you, you won't, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you won't have the, you won't have the weather elements that you had last year. And that game, that game was crazy with the weather. This, I mean, if you're going to go to Pittsburgh, go now. You know, oh yeah, go, go go early, go early September. You don't have to really worry about that. Um, as, as far as that goes, anyway, um, what what other notes do we have from the from the win against the win against the Ravens? Because the, I mean, I, I, that's obviously, um, you know, does a healthy scratch from Cleveland Cleveland Farrell does that? You know, with with, with Nasbitt and and some injuries on that D line. I think um also. Darius Phylon got hurt as well. He might not play this week. Um, does does Cleveland make a reappearance for the Raiders here yeah I fully expect them to be active um it depends on the health of Ngakwe I could see in a scenario where he, he plays outside and inside um I think you're going to see him on some third down uh, rushes from the interior um clearly he might get some on the outside to give Crosby or, or NASA a break at times um but he's going to be active because if, if Yannick goes out there. If Angaku goes out there and, and pulls the hamstring the first quarter, you got to have another defensive end that's up. And I don't think Koontz is ready for that. Uh, but but Farrell, hopefully this lights a fire under him and we see, you know, he's always given good effort. I'm not worried about the effort from him. Now it's about production. He needs to go out there. And, and clearly they thought NASA was a better option. And, and through one week, Gus Bradley is probably right. Like he, he got to the quarterback. He held up in the run game. He was much better player week one than we saw last year. Uh, any point, any point last year. 
any point, point last year. Any point last year. Uh, so. and, and and Bradley, it's just nice to see some of the adjustments he made. They ran the same coverage like ninety percent of this game. Like same guys lined up in the same spots, cover yeah. three. Uh, it was like, here's your responsibilities. The guy doesn't know what to do. But if you noticed late in the fourth quarter and then into overtime, a little bit more too high, some cover four looks. He blitzed twice in this game. And on, he got two sacks and a fumble on those two blitzes. Paul Gunther could have blitzed 10 times in that game and never gotten near the quarterback and mm-hmm. gave up three touchdowns. So ju- just the fact that, you know, the designs on those blitzes were really good. Um, you can do some cover one blitzes out of, out of a cover three defense because you're basically lining up the secondary the same way. Um, so, but this is the week I think we learn about the secondary. I think Rothaberger is going to challenge those guys, and we're going to learn a lot about Nate Hobbs against Juju Smith Schuster on the interior. And we're going to learn a lot about Trayvon Moore this week because he's going to have to cover down the field against, you know, Chase Claypool on some post routes and deep routes. And then clearly uh, Deontay Johnson's a good player as well. And James Washington's not a slouch as a fourth receiver either. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have, I mean, I'm not sure. It's so funny how the cold weather Steelers are basically probably the best team in the history of the national football league at drafting wide receivers. Like I cannot think of a, I cannot think of an organization that has done a better job at drafting wide receivers than the Pittsburgh Steelers. They just, my entire life, they've had great um, wide receiver um, wide receiver play. Um, it, it's been incredible. It's been incredible as far as far as it's going I will mention goes. this too. Like I watched that Pittsburgh Buffalo game last week and Buffalo or Pittsburgh's offense got shut out in the first half. Roethlisberger aren't, doesn't look like he has near the same arm strength he used to have. Um, he'll take some shots down the field, but not nearly as much. He's getting rid of the ball in two, 2.1, 2.2 seconds. It's a lot of short underneath stuff uh, and letting those guys run. So the Raiders are going to have to rally and tackle. They, they can't go out there and miss tackles this week. Let them catch the ball and get them on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're playing They're playing a, a defense that, that they look very comfortable in as, as far as that goes. They look very comfortable um, in, that, in that game as far as, far as that goes. Um, Gruden. You know, EPMD used to have a song called Total Chaos Mass Confusion. And at the end of the, some of these games, it feels like he is not, the heartbeat is not slow. He doesn't, he's not in command of what's going on. Like, I mean, the whole like field goal unit, not no field goal unit. Um, you know, after, after what we thought Edwards did as far as um, winning the game, he didn't win the game. Okay, fine, guy. You pull everybody over. And if you got to call a timeout, hey guys, timeout, let's just go win the game on a one yard line. Like, it just seemed like everything was all chaotic. Did it feel that way in the stadium as well? It did. Uh, in the stadium, when he scored, it erupted. They went crazy. Uh, we didn't hear in the stadium there was an announcement. It was under review. So, to, to us in the stadium, we just saw the players on the field shaking hands, and we're like, oh, this game's over. Uh, and then when he, when they did make the announcement that it was overturned, uh, when they showed it, they finally showed it on the big screen. But for there was a couple of minutes there where everyone in the stadium thought the game was over. Um, but to come out, you know, you have – a fullback, you're, you have 23 personnel, you have Jacobs, like quarterback sneak fine, but uh, I think clearly the fall starts would kill it. They probably were going to run the ball four times there uh, and try to win that game, but then he puts Willie Sneed in. Great design. He was wide open. Willie Sneed played two snaps the whole game. Like, if you're going to draw that up, throw it to Renfro. Um, there was some pressure. Uh, Illuminaire got beat there. Carr had to get rid of it pretty quickly, put some steam on it. It I'm not going to fall into, oh, it was a drop camp, like a lot of the people in the stadium were saying. It was, he threw that thing with some mustard on. It was pretty, pretty high and outside uh, the, the frame there. He could have put it on him, but again, he, he was under pressure. But why, why draw that up for Willie Sneed right there? The guy, the guy hasn't played the whole game. He, he's your smallest receiver, basically. I, I don't get it. Um, That's thinking way too much. That, that, that in my mind, that, that was just like you know, you can run that for for running for Monroe, Monroe, like you know, what I mean, running for somebody. I mean, yeah. the play was the play was per, per perfect. It kind of reminded me of the play that they used. It wasn't the same play, but the same play they used to beat Pittsburgh not too long ago, um, um, where where Carrier had the game winner at the end. Yeah. Um, so, and, and to be honest, they didn't show this in the replay on that field goal. Daniel Carlson was warming up on the net on the far end of the field. He wasn't on the same side of the field as the offense was. So I don't know if he got the call. It was second down. So it was a kicker. You know, as a kicker, it goes through your mind, hey, third down, maybe I run out there, drop snap. We have an opportunity to get on fourth down. He probably it never occurred to him that they were going to kick it on second. And they couldn't find him is what happened. Like everyone in the stadium, really, and everyone in the stadium knew they didn't have any timeouts. We're like, what's going on here? And 
thankfully they they took the delay of game. They didn't try to snap it and, and miss it and have chaos with three or four seconds left on the shot clock. So credit to the, the field goal unit to not go out there and actually snap and try it in panic mode. But at the same time, you, that that can't happen. You're going to lose games that, with decisions that happen like that. Yeah, yeah, that was way that was way too much. That, 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 that was absolutely way too much going on there. And I just felt like you. I thought that was just time, like just to call timeout. Hey guys, we're at the one yard line. We're, we're at the one yard line. Let's go out here and um and um and, and go out there and um and, and win that game. So I don't have any more notes for that for, for the game as far as that goes. Um, on the Pittsburgh, and we talked about that a, a little bit. Um, let's finish up with that. I mean, um, I did not think the Raiders. I thought I thought it almost happened. I thought the Raiders were going to you know, be a, a, it would be a close game, and then Lamar Jackson would make one play that we would all be crying about um, all week, and then um, the Raiders would lose. They didn't. They did not lose. They won that game. They 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 took it from them. I mean, they forced those turnovers. There's some turnovers that are that are giveaways. Um, like like the car interception, the little, little, little giveaway, but the Raiders took the football away from this team um, on a couple of occasions here. What are your thoughts about this team going to Pittsburgh? I think they can really the defense again. I mean, they have an opportunity to win this game, to win this game out here because you know this is just take a just take a um, notes from what Buffalo did. I mean, they still shut them out for a half. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty good defensive work right there. And if the Raiders will shut somebody out for a half. That that's a good that's a good sign for them. Yeah, this this Baltimore game to finish the comments. Um, Lamar did have that run with about a minute and forty five seconds left. We had that thirty yard run, twenty eight yard run to put him basically in field goal range. Um, credit to the defense for stopping him on that third down rollout because if if Lamar Jackson gets a first down there, the game's over. Yeah. They're going to run the clock out and kick it at zero zero. So props to the defense. And if you watch that play, it's really KJ Wright and Denzel Perryman who understand who to cover in the flat there. And then everyone was able to rally and get to Jackson. So um, that goes unnoticed, but watching the replay, like KJ Wright basically made that play by staying on the fullback and not running straight to Lamar Jackson and trusting that his teammates were coming. Um, and that game reminded me a lot of the 2018 game at the Oakland Coliseum against Cleveland, where they were down, they won 45 to 42 in overtime, but they yeah. stopped Nick Chubb, I think on a, it was either a third or a fourth down late in the game to get the ball back. Cause if Nick Chubb would have got a first down, the game was over. So the Raiders are about a yard away from losing that game. Yeah. I'm um, we able to make the stop, but, but moving forward, I, I wasn't impressed watching Pittsburgh's offense last week. I don't think they ran the ball very well. I they didn't run block very well. They didn't pass block very well uh, for the first half. And, and if they don't block that punt late in the third quarter, early fourth quarter and return it for a touchdown. I mean, this game was, 10 to three, or it was 10 to 10 at that point. It, it was really close. And but Buffalo didn't play very well. Buffalo came out and thought that they, they could not run the ball at all. Um, and combine that with trying to throw deep routes down the field with, with Diggs and Gabriel Davis. And they just couldn't hold up and pass protection. If you're not going to run the ball against Pittsburgh, you got to go to the short passing game because you can't let that pass rush get, get to you. Um, and they weren't very, I don't think they were very converted. It surprised me. I didn't think Brian Dable had a very good game plan going into that game just watching yeah. it from a distance without breaking it down on the l22 i think gruden uh will be able to cook some stuff up work underneath get and cars really good at working you know out of out of the shotgun with zero um uh, with five wide or maybe a running back in the backfield and understanding who to go to and what match mismatches it's going to be a lot of like i said four or five six yard passes some raider fans might get upset but that's the way they're going to have to move the ball against them and then take your shots when they're there i i, I do think if the raiders can avoid some holding penalties and getting into some long down and distance and not turn the ball over. That's going to be the key. They can't turn the ball over. So if, if they can minimize the holding penalties and not turn the ball over, run it when they need to, they have a chance to go on the road and win this game. Cause I, I don't think Pittsburgh's offense is anywhere near uh, as good as people are making out to be after watching that game. So I think it's going to be a close game though. I think it's going to come down to, you know, field goal three or four points. Now remember Heinz field, when you kick to the open end, it's very difficult to make, you know, 45, 50 yard field goals. They're just kind of how the wind works. Hopefully it's not yeah. very windy, but the kicking game could become an issue here. Uh, if you're kicking to that open end of the stadium, but um, I don't know if you want me to give you a prediction, but I, I, I do have one for you this week. I'm sure you do. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we, we said last week, this isn't a Homer show. This is a very difficult game. The Raiders are missing a ton of guys. They're dinged up. It's, they played an overtime game week one against Buffalo or Baltimore. 
They got to travel across the country for a 10 o'clock game. They do have a chance to win this game, but I'm going to think Pittsburgh's defense just going to be the pass rush is going to be a little bit too much. I don't think the Raiders are going to establish a run game. Low scoring, though, I'm going to say 20, 20 to 17, Pittsburgh wins on a field goal late. Yeah. I think that the Raiders get off to a really good start in this game, and then they feel the effects of the short week, the travel, and maybe in the second half. And then um, they make – I mean, listen, I, I think they could they could easily play this game again in the playoffs and the Raiders win it because the Raiders would the Raiders just be better at that point. But I just I just like the timing of it. it, it even if it was a 4 o'clock start, I would give the Raiders more of a chance um, just to give a little bit more time. Um, you come off an overtime victory as well. So they are – like I said, I think what the Raven win gave them is an opportunity in the first quarter of the season to be 3-1. and one. It's a possibility now. So – I really like that um, possibility, and if they win this one, then then they're really going to be on their way. But I, th- I I just see a close loss. I just see a close loss here. Um, we'll go 23-20, um, you know, late field goal. Um, but it, it, it's a loss that'll probably hurt. But you know, the Raiders will. Uh, I think they'll bounce back when they play Miami um, in, at home um, the following week. I think they're going to be able to move the ball okay. My concerns are when they get into the red zone. This is going to be another one of those weeks where the inability, I think, to run the football. Mm-hmm. and the red zone is going to show up and they, they may be kicking some field goals here when when they should be walking away with touchdowns but uh it's tough i don't without the running i don't think they're going to be able to run much play action here i don't think they're going to have time to take shots down the field so um Derek carr is going to have to be on his game they're going to have to know where all these blitzes are coming from i know pittsburgh didn't blitz much last week but they still used a lot of simulated pressures where they brought four uh, but they drop a lineman out and bring an extra back or they bring the corner. TJ Watt would walk around. He'd blitz in the A gap. Those don't go down technically as blitzes because it's only a four-man rush, but they are. They're simulated pressures. So um, yeah. Pittsburgh's going to cook some stuff up, and they're going to they're going to target Andre James and Illuminaire for sure. And then you have Leatherwood's a rookie. So that right side of the offensive line, you're going to see a lot of overload, exotic looks, and they're going to bring it. Yeah. Because um, I think they're going to be able to hold up because they know that um, – unless Carr just comes out and throws a couple of bombs early to try to back them out of that and connect on them like they did against Kansas city. Cause I think they're going to do a lot of that. You're going to see the free safety fence. Patrick's going to drop down in the box, a lot of rat or robber coverage, and they're going to force the Raiders to try to throw it over the top. So we'll see if they actually try it and if they can do Baltimore tried like they, in the first half, it was literally man on man. We're going to bracket Waller with the safety, a single high look 90% of the time. And they didn't really, start trying to take advantage of that to the second half. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens as far as that goes. Um, uh, a tough game this week. And, and if they can, they listen, they, they started, the Raiders have to become a really good home team. They did that already. I said, you know, they got nine home games, go seven and two, you're halfway, you're halfway there for the playoffs. And, and then after that, we'll take some road games and see what happens as far as that goes. Um, put, on, put on Raiders podcast. Uh, That's pretty much it, folks. Um, We'll see you next time.